And welcome back to Across the Board with E and the Colonel here on Hawk Radio, hawkradio.org. Uh, I don't know, man. We're stellar every week. It's not us. It's our guests that are stellar every week. And, uh, again, here, here we do it again. One of uh, my favorite bands from the 90s and um, just came out with another new album, Crash Test Dummies. Great band, innovative band, creative, just something different, refreshing. And we have the heart and soul of Crash Test Dummies, Brad Roberts, on the line. Brad, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thanks, E. Good, good. Uh, so I know you're on the, uh, the East Coast now, but you guys are um, you know, out of Canada and um, you know, working from there. What do you see as the difference between, um, you know, you guys have had different commercial success in the U.S. and Canada, Juno Awards, Grammy Awards. What do you see as the difference between the audiences in Canada as opposed to the U.S. and, and beyond? Um, audiences in Canada are harder to please. People in Canada are generally quieter than people in America. Okay. Um, not nearly as rowdy. Uh, and just generally tougher, I would say. Hmm. And I don't think it's that they enjoy the music any less. I think that they're just by temperament a little bit less, um, a little, a little less outward in their feelings, perhaps, than uh, our American counterparts. Yeah, more reserved, maybe. I see what you're saying. Now, what do you? Obviously, you have the signature voice. Everyone knows you um, from your voice alone. How has that affected you on the road? I mean, when do people recognize you in person or not recognize you in person? Then you speak, and they're like, wait a minute, I know that voice. Does that happen to you quite often? You know, it's funny. That does happen, and I think it takes some good ears to be able to do that because out of context, you know, people think of me as the guy with the long hair from the video. Oh, know? yeah. And I don't have long hair right. anymore. So, and I'm not nearly as recognizable just because we're not in the public eye to the same degree so yeah i do get some i do get some sites of recognition from people who uh don't catch on to i open my mouth <laughs> now obviously uh mm, 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 was the, you know the biggest hit for you guys uh, but uh, you know great other songs um afternoons and coffee spoons is actually my favorite by you guys and it's it's kind of, it's an obvious allusion to the T. S. Eliot poet, the love song of J. Offer Proofrock, correct? Yes. So what what inspired you to write the song out of that poem? Um, well, I was just coming out of college at that time, doing a degree in English literature and philosophy, and um, I used to keep a copy of T. S. Eliot's poems at my side when I was writing. Okay. It was kind of a superstitious thing. Every now and then, when I didn't have any ideas, I'd open it up and flip around. And I wasn't really looking for ideas so much as just trying to get my head into a different place. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, that one just seemed to work nicely. And I thought, I got, well, this way I get to show off my education and it's <laughs> <laughs> a good point. <laughs> have the snob factor going, and so he ended up in there. Nice. Now, let's talk about Ooh La La. So this came out last year, um, you know, and basically you were just sort of, uh, you know, messing around with new songs and, and writing a few here and there. And you you wrote it with what I've read you described as toys. You, you wrote it with something called an octagon uh, and an omnicord. And, and it basically is sort of like a, I guess, like a weird toy version of a Casio keyboard. Is that right? Something like that? That's very close. Sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> there have always, well, not always, but since the 70s, I can remember there being what I would call amateurists' um, in instruments. Uh, they're not necessarily toys, per se, but they aren't real instruments either, okay. um, to the extent that rather than playing them manually, you'll press a button and it'll bring up automatically a bunch of you know accompanying chords. Got it. And you just press different buttons in that with your left hand, and then with your right hand, you're playing on a on a keyboard that looks like a piano keyboard, and you play the melody on that. It's quite a bit like an accordion, mm -hmm. with the accordion buttons on one side and the keyboard on the other, only it's spread out over an entire keyboard length, and and looks like a little a, a little organ, you know. Um, now, having said that, it's an extremely unique toy because 
it um, rather than synthesizing sounds, it actually plays back recordings of people who have created the sound, who have created the sound by recording real players. Okay, that's interesting. In other words, it doesn't generate them electronically. Someone went into a studio and said, hey, you guys, play a blues shuffle. Play it in all keys. Play it at different tempos. And they feed, fed all this information into it. So now I come along and I play back these things and I, and I hear what they recorded. Now, that, doesn't, that sounds kind of like sampling, you know. Exactly. But, but this was 1970, long before there was anything like sampling. And it's based on a film technology, opt an optical technology, hence OptiGon, mm -hmm. G-A-N being from organ and Opti being from optical. So the sounds on this thing are really creepy and old and weird, for one thing, which I love. And the other thing is that um, they did many, many genres. So, for example, you can buy a disc for country music. You, it's called Nashville. You can buy a disc for the blues. You can buy a disc for... Hey, it's One's called the Gay 90s Waltz, which is basically <laughs> a three, four-time orchestra. Okay. Uh, an orchestra playing this weepy string stuff in three, four time. Um, so there, there's all kinds of options. And every day I would go in, we'd put in a different disc, and a, it would inspire us in a different way. And lo and behold, we'd, a song would be written for, for us practically by the machine. That's incredible. <laughs> Yeah, we have the uh, we just got the new CD here at the station, and and I'm loving it. Yeah, it is it is incredibly different, but how cool does it sound? And you know, on your website you talked about um, how you you know, and it's beautiful is actually a, a a love song, and that they're hard to write. Happy songs are hard to write. That when you were younger, you actually couldn't write a full blown love song without making yourself sick. Can you talk about that? Like how you have changed as a as a man and how your writing, I guess, the thought process has changed through that. Yeah, that particular tune was um, was so peppy and cheerful that I couldn't imagine writing my usual apocalyptic lyrics to it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I think when I was young, I was very much afraid of writing stupid love songs because there's too many of them, and I always had kind of a disregard for people who never went further than that in their imaginations. Right. But, you know, now I'm old. <laughs> now, <laughs> a little more tolerant. <laughs> and uh, so uh, even though it is unner unnerving for me sometimes to hear myself singing such positive, happy words, <laughs> I have gone to that age where now I can do that. <laughs> Now, you guys are on tour again, and uh, I think it's going to be a great thing. Uh, talk a little bit about the tour and uh, what the tour is going to accomplish and uh, what, what you feel like this tour is going to differentiate from the other tours you've been on before. Um, well, you know, one of the nice things about touring for this record is that, uh, well, it's not nice. It just happened to work out this way, and it, it happened to work out well. Uh, our, our drummer, Mitch Dorch, and our bass player, my brother Dan Roberts, both have kids. Dan's are younger, um, but in, in any case, they're both family men. And it would be pretty much leaving their wives in the lurch with all those kids mm -hmm. to just take off and go on the road. So they're really not in a position to do that. Um, and I thought, well, you know, why not do a trio with me and Ellen, who are available, neither of us want children. <laughs> <laughs> And um, use one of the guitar players that we use so very often for over the last 20 years. He's practically an honorary crash test dummy at this point, Stuart Cameron. And um, so there's just the three of us, and it makes it possible to tour for the first time in a, in a long time and actually make some money because there's only three people. There's very little gear. There's not a big drum kit to be flying around and paying for. We don't need any crew members. Cause, and um, I don't even play guitar. I just sing. Oh, wow. It's me singing, Alan singing, and one guitar player. And, um, you know, at first, to be honest, I was a little worried that people would be coming up to me saying, well, where are you been, man? What's the deal? <laughs> but in, instead, people have come to me 
almost universally have said, wow, that was such a treat to, see, to be able to hear you guys strip down like that and hear the songs, you know, so clearly and the lyrics are so so clear because I'm not competing with a drummer. Right. Um, so the, the live act has turned around and become something quite different than it was before and, and, and I think quite amazing. I th it, it's a, ironic, but it's almost a more powerful sound without a drummer because when you've got, just got the one instrument, if the guitar player plays quietly, you know, you can hear a pin drop in the house. Right. It's very dynamic. Whereas if the guitar player strums along like a maniac, it'll sound like a locomotive train coming down the tracks. <laughs> That's a good point. You know, um, so there's there's uh, really nice advantages to, to the trio, both economically and musically. Well, and they say the, the the test of a great song is if it can stand uh, play, played in different ways. So, you know, full production and acoustic, and uh, obviously your songs can do that. So really looking forward to the tour. Uh, make sure, folks, you go out and check out CrashTestDummies.com. Ooh La La just came out last year. This is the one we're talking about with the Octagon. Very different album, but loving it. So go check it out. You can hear some of those songs here on Hawk Radio. And, uh, you know, definitely go check these guys out on tour. Uh, support them and, and really look forward to, to hearing the kind of stripped down versions of the songs, Brad. Well, thank you very much, man. Yeah, thanks. You know, we appreciate the time today. And, uh, again, check out Crash Test Dummies, and we'll keep you updated uh, as to where they are touring. And, of course, our show is heard around the world, so we'll keep you uh, – we'll let you know wherever they are. This has been Across the Board with E and the Colonel here on Hawk Radio. We'll be back in a second. HawkRadio.org. Thank you.